So um, first of all, yes, thanks, Julia, for joining us to talk about um, successful women on International Women's Day. I, I know that you've been very successful at the UK Data Service. So to start with, I wonder if you could tell us about how long you've been at the service and also all about your job. Sure. Um, I started in October 2019. And so that puts me at not quite a year and a half with the service. And what I do here is I lead the computational social science training team, which is um, a mix of some research, but mostly sort of ad hoc webinars and, and workshop presentation on topics of computational and empirical social science. Essentially, we're trying to get people trained in social science to put down their clipboards for a moment and think beyond traditional social science methods into things like maybe web scraping and machine learning or, or um, you know, sort of combining the surveys that they're used to using with things like real time uh, wearable data collection and things like that, you know, just sort of somewhat bonkers things, maybe fill in some of the gaps that are not necessarily very attainable with traditional methods, but that are more attainable now with, with high powered computing and, and sort of fully interconnected world of digital nonsense. Is this, is this how um, new is this kind of approach to, to using data in this way? Is it quite a kind of a new and up, up and coming way of doing things? It's definitely up and coming, but I wouldn't say it's entirely new. I'd say it's it's been a bit slow to get off the ground, but it's now gathering speed. And I think that's because it's quite diverse. There's a lot of different ways that people can use computational methods or sort of empirical data collection in social science. Uh, and there hasn't been anyone yet who's put it all together as a new category. And so that's that's a development that's helping it gain speed. And is the idea to sort of bring different kind of data sets together so you could buy and look at them across the board so that you can have the most impact on changing policy or, or improving people's lives? It's certainly one way is that if you gather multiple different kinds of data, you get new perspectives on established problems. Um, but there's also just new problems um, that we've never been able to address before that we can only address if we have you know, maybe computers to deal with millions of um, comments on a, you know, um, newspaper article or something like that, that that wouldn't have been possible before we had sort of com computational assistance, um, you know, and then different kinds of, of methods and approaches allow you to either address old questions in new ways or with maybe new support, new insights or entirely new questions and some combination of the two. So sometimes in addressing an old question, we discover a new question or a new avenue or maybe a new perspective. Well, that works sounds very interesting. And as we said before, you've been very successful in your career so far. But have there been times along the way when you've had to face challenges because you're a woman? And if so, how did you overcome them? That's a little bit tricky. I think all of the challenges that I faced are a kind of the slippery cultural challenges that are that are hard to document and hard to discuss. So things like um, discussing over lunch, maybe with colleagues one day, someone had talked about quotas, uh, gender quotas for for new hiring projects, and he commented that he th he couldn't understand how women who got hired wouldn't second guess their ability to do the job on the basis that they would think, well, I was only hired because of this quota. And I, I said, but if there's no quotas, how, how does a man who gets the job not think, have I only got this job because I'm a man? And he'd never even considered it. It, it had just never crossed his mind. And it's just that kind of little cultural issue that, that people, it was nice that we, we could have that discussion and, and feel free to talk about potentially tricky things. But it shows that in a lot of cultures, people have never really critically applied some of the experiences that women talk about. So do you think there still is a kind of unconscious bias or in that example, there probably was unconscious bias. And um, is, that, is that, have things moved on since that point, I guess? Um, uh, I think certainly some some offices and it's it's down to good leadership that individual offices can encourage people to reflect, to be curious about the lived experiences of others and to look into actually, is anyone feeling marginalized here? How can I address that? 
and others are really focused on you know productivity and achieving goals and doing things and therefore they they don't some leaders don't make an effort to, to ensure that um, people reflect on potential challenges in the workplace. And, and when you come across that, that comment there, which um, is out of the blue, um, because I know that International Women's Day is all about um, choose to challenge. Um, so do you think it's important to, in those situations to choose to challenge um, and not and not just accept it? Yeah, it's difficult and it you have to really pick your battles. In that case, I did feel um, that I could challenge him and I could say, well, you know, don't men feel the same kind of uh, self, like imposter syndrome, kind of self-doubt. But not everyone would feel comfortable challenging people. And, and certainly you might feel comfortable challenging your close friends, but maybe not your boss or, the, you know, there's all kinds of times that are appropriate for a challenge and times that are not. And I think it's important for people like me that are perhaps a bit loud and shouty <laughs> to challenge more often because the people who are a bit quiet and um, you know retiring won't challenge and uh, I don't know so far challenging has not come to any harm for me that I know of <laughs> um, so it, it's good as well to demonstrate that sometimes challenging at least sometimes doesn't doesn't have any negative consequences and potentially has positives. So is it important that um, younger women coming into um um, male dominated environments or in any environment really do feel confident that they can speak, speak their mind um, is there anything you could, you'd say to younger people to encourage them to, to find a way of establishing equality in their workplace that's quite difficult um, in an ideal world I, I think yes everyone should feel confident to speak their mind but that's the kind of thing that you get through experience and so far a lot of people are still experiencing situations where speaking their mind has negative outcomes for them so I think rather than encouraging women to gain confidence and speak their mind I think it would be helpful to enforce policies where everyone is allowed to speak their mind you know I think I think there has to be a bit of a cultural change that involves both bottom up and top down kind of demonstration of change. So you said, you said there's sort of work to be done on that kind of uh, approach and cultural change in organisations? In society as a whole, yes. Yeah. I think um, I've had the good good luck to work in, in a few different spaces where there was much less problems than I could see other people having. Um, for example, where I did my PhD was at a university that I think was some departments were 90% male and 10% female. And one of my friends who worked in that department, she really struggled with people being dismissive of her and critical of, of you know, things that she did in ways that they weren't critical of, of male colleagues. And she didn't feel like she had a lot of support in that context. Whereas I was in a, a department that was about 60-40 uh, still favoring men it was an engineering university and but I, I felt like I could say what I wanted to say and I felt like there weren't negative consequences for having a differing opinion so it, it's fits and starts some areas are moving faster than others I guess you, you won't have all the answers but do you have any ideas on how, how they could uh, how, how things could change what policies could be put in place to make things more equal I think as a data scientist, I'd like to see some more data, some more research, empirical research specifically, and possibly computational research done on the effectiveness of different interventions. Because I think a lot of people are keen to point out the issues and they're keen to write up reports about where things are now, and they're less keen to go out on a limb and try new things even though it's only by trying new things and seeing what happens that we can really learn effectively what works and what doesn't. Um, but there's a, there's a real unwillingness to try things that might go wrong and might have negative consequences. Rightly so, no one wants negative consequences, but you have to, you learn by failing rather than achieving perfection the first time. That's really interesting. So in a way, we, there's sort of more work to be done on, on looking at the data or what, 
what works and what doesn't work and then coming up with new conclusions. Yeah, well, I think quite rightly, people are, are unhappy to think that they're being made into a human experiment. Nobody wants to be the guinea pigs in a big social experiment. But if we never do any experiments, then we, we don't really gain good data of a variety of potential interventions in different cases. So, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I don't have a good solution on how to convince people to be okay with being experimented on, but <laughs> it must be done. <laughs> no, it's just really difficult because, like you say, if you speak up, then you're at risk you're alone, aren't you? And, it, and really the emphasis should be on the institution to instill that safety, really. Yeah, wow. um, but exactly how to instill that safety is, is not clear. And so, yeah, we've got to just try a few things and see how people feel and, you know, it's it's difficult and it's uncomfortable certainly for institutions to admit that they haven't been doing the best that they could have been and that things that they had may perhaps dismissed as possibilities are in fact quite effective solutions but um yeah try and see throw it at the wall see if it sticks yeah so you know, it's good that we're aware of these things and we're thinking about it and there's been improvements but just have this conversation makes you realize that there's no definite there's no definite solution out there yet, even though we all talk yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, we definitely don't know how to fix these problems. And that's not surprising because they're complex problems full of, you know, years of cultural evolution and, and people who are at best erratic and sometimes downright, like, un, un, unintelligible you know we don't know what people are saying even much less why they do the things they do and it can be quite difficult to try and imagine how solutions will go you know every economic interventions for example often have unintended consequences and we have to expect that some of that will happen with you know gender policy change and things like that as well yeah. but yeah if, if you never so, do anything, you'll never get any consequences. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank Julia today for her time in talking about her experiences as a woman in the world of data, especially for International Women's Day. And we'll be back again soon with some more podcasts from experts.